Hi, I'm Jim Woodburn, um, Chief Orbital Scientist at Analytical Graphics, and I'm here today with my friends John Carrico and Lisa Paula Castry from Space Exploration Engineering, and we're just going to have a little bit of coffee talk about uh, orbit determination in the cislunar and lunar realms. Uh, this is going to be based on our experience with prior missions and what we've been seeing lately in industry. So, John and Lisa, welcome. Good oh. to see you guys. Thanks, Jim. Hi, Jim. Let's I talk think for clarification purposes, we already established that three, the three of us are all drinking tea and not coffee. So, yes, that's very important. It's the first, uh, first rule of lunar OD coffee is a no no. Yeah, no, it's got to be tea. It's definitely got to be tea. So John and Lisa, just for a quick context, um, can you guys mention some of the uh, the past lunar missions that you've uh, worked on in terms of doing the orbit determination? Yeah, go for it, Lisa. Sure, yeah. So back in 2013 and 2014, the LADI mission was in operation. So we, John and I both supported that mission um, out at NASA Ames. Mission Operations Center. Um, so we, you know, we were on that mission from the basically from the beginning, from phase B all the way until um, impact. So about a five-year time span from when we started working on the mission concept and trying to figure out what it is, um, you know, which tracking uh, ground stations we were going to use, how much tracking data we would need, and then take, making that into an operational plan and flying it. Um, so we worked on that mission. It was a it was a big success, I would say. But um, then the other mission we worked on more recently in 2019 was it um, Bear Sheet when Bear Sheet uh, Space IL that we supported that mission. Um, the main operators were in Israel, but um, John and I both worked with those um, operators with the flight dynamics team out there to prepare for the launch and operations from an OD trajectory perspective. And then uh, we helped with flying the mission and going through the tracking data. And Jim, you looked at that data live with us as well. Um, so the three of us all have experience. It's a lot one. of fun that mission. Yeah. And you got and in you fact, got our, our videos right now are showing the control rooms where we worked and did that OD, really. If you think about it, right? We we were remote here in the U.S. while the um, primary operators were in Israel. Yeah, didn't you guys um, train the Israeli operators as well on how to fly right. that mission? We we did. We developed a lot of um, simulated tracking data, simulation um, exercises. And uh, the team there had were very experienced team members for flying other satellite missions, but hadn't flown a lunar mission before. So um, we developed a, you know, some training scenarios and simulated data with, you know, imperfect um, maneuvers, you know, leading up to that whole pre-launch um, time frame to, to we could have that as practice and rehearsals. Um, right. and, that, and that was kind of patterned off of what uh, had been done with Laddie, right? Had, with the uh, simulating the, the mission and different anomalies and running the flight dynamics team through those types of exercises. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, as, think, you, as you mentioned, the, the Israeli team was familiar with flying Earth missions but had not done a lunar mission before. And I think that that's something that we're seeing a lot of is that with the um, explosion of missions to lunar and cislunar space, there's more and more folks who are interested in flying these types of missions um, who have prior experience with flying missions around the Earth, but just haven't done uh, missions in those particular regimes before. And so, I think one thing that might be interesting to people is you know, how is it different? How do lunar missions differ from Earth missions, both in terms of, of planning and then in terms of actual you know, flight? Um, 
I know one thing, John, that you had been talking about earlier was how so many Earth missions these days use uh, GPS receivers on board. Uh, that serves as their main source of tracking data. But of course, that's problematic for a mission going to the moon. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so there, it is exciting. Um, it is exciting just to see that there is this big pushback to the moon. Um, a kind of cool part of it is it's not only NASA going back to the moon the way they did in the Apollo days, but you've got um, NASA and the US deciding to buy commercial services to have their payloads delivered. So like the um, NASA CLIPS program, the uh, Commercial Lunar Payload Services contract, NASA is just buying from commercial companies who are taking things to the moon. So you now are building this ecosystem of commercial companies that are a delivery service to the moon. Um, as a result, those commercial companies are trying to hire people who have experience, but because we don't have a lot of folks who have flown missions to the moon, what they do is they hire experienced folks who have flown LEOs and GEOs, and this is what we saw at Space IL. They had some extremely experienced satellite operators, but they haven't seen what the difference is between flying a low Earth orbit or a geo or flying something to the moon. And some of the stuff is very similar and some is very different. But just right now, the, the need, um, there's this kind of need for people to learn about OD. And it, too bad we're not doing a webinar on lunar OD. So people can learn how to do it. That'd be a great idea. That's a great idea. So um, what, what's really funny is a lot of times, um, Lisa, you and I have run into people who are more experienced than us in flying satellites, but it's always been around this planet. You know, and always so around this planet, right? Yeah. So it's it's been kind of fun to to trade, you know, um, stories on, well, this is the same as UT around the moon, but you know, this is different. And and the first thing that just needs to be said is there right now there's no GPS system around the moon. You know, so back back in the day around the earth, people would do radiometric tracking for low earth orbit. And for geostationary orbit, we still do range, ranging and we use um optical angle measurements for geostationary. Um, but when you get to the moon there you know, you're you're back completely to radiometric tracking, even if you're a low lunar orbit. There's there's no GPS yet. There's some experiments that people are flying that um, hopefully someday we'll have a position navigation and timing capability at the moon to do you know the onboard uh, positioning. But right now we're doing um, we're doing uh, measuring range values, measuring Doppler values, and things like that. So so. So kind of we're seeing the things that you might see for a geostationary transfer or for a geostationary orbit, I, I think. Yeah, now, am I correct that the, the MMX program, do I have that right? Is it MMX, the NASA program that had the uh, GPS receiver on board that used it at really high altitude? Yeah. That was MMS. MMS. Thank you. <laughs> the MMS program um, was able to show that you're able to uh, use GPS at much higher altitudes. But I think that that was some specialized hardware that was on board. I don't think that was a standard spaceborne GPS receiver. So um, now, with the influx of lunar missions as well, though, I think people are also looking at alternative ways of tracking. Some of the things that we've heard interest in uh, is the use of um, optical navigation techniques, especially during you know, the cislunar part of the mission. Um, people are talking about satellite to satellite tracking you know, when you're dealing with multiple satellites performing uh, a common mission. And we're seeing all different sizes of satellites as well, right? I mean, you used to think of a lunar mission as being a big deal um, you know, with a big budget and large spacecraft. Um, you know, if you think back to Apollo, you know, huge spacecraft. But nowadays we're talking about CubeSat missions. 
Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. And um, what uh, ground architectures are capable of supporting those missions? And so yeah. with those with those small sats and um, these commercial missions, a lot of them are on the cheap. You know, they don't have large budget. So how do you then, they're trying to build the spacecraft hardware and test that and, you know, pay all the people to do it. And then still, how are we going to fly it? Or how much tracking, you know, time do we need to buy from the ground stations? What propulsion system are we going to put on this thing? And going with some non-traditional alternatives that may be cheaper, that area, and then you know, then it's, you're sort of in this infinite loop sometimes of evaluating, you know, all of the trade space of a new propulsion system while trying to track it and perform critical maneuvers, you know, to capture into lunar orbit. It's, it's just a lot on the table um, looking at the trade space um, with these, you know, cheaper modern satellites. <laughs> right. Definitely. And when you think about that, when you think about putting a bunch of new technology up there, um, like the traditional trajectories to the moon were these, you know, three day, four day, five day uh, direct transfer type trajectories. Um, and if you're dealing with new technologies, that doesn't give you a lot of time really to test things out between, you know, when you launch and when you're going to need to set up and perform a critical lunar orbit insertion maneuver. Um, now, I know that um, some, some missions uh, are flying different types of trajectories to the moon. Uh, with yeah, hey, Jim, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I have um, a scenario I can share um, with all the different phasing loops, because I thought we could talk about the different cislunar because you've mentioned the system your transfers a couple times. Yeah. So, let's let's go. Share the screen. And, and, and Jim, I can show you that was the Apollo. This is the phasing loop. I can show it in this uh, rotating frame where you can see it. Yeah, that's a nice view. Oh. Yeah, so, so, so um, Jim, you had mentioned that um, you know the the ways that people get to the moon on um, are different than we've done in the past Be because of of low cost and because of using ride chairs getting on different launch vehicles and things like that. So th this is an example of a direct um, five day transfer from the Earth to the Moon. Uh, this is the Moon's orbit in white, and this is our home planet. Jim, I think that's where you were born, if I remember yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, right in that planet. So, so that's that's one way to get to the moon. And when you're doing orbit determination on that, it's it's pretty challenging because you never go through a whole orbit. Right, and it, and as you guys know, like certain um, things that are estimated along with the orbit, such as tracking station uh, biases um, and force model uh, parameters. A lot of those don't really become observable on just a portion of an orbit. A lot of times you need uh, one or even multiple orbits for certain things to become fully observable. So, you know, tracking on a, um, a trajectory like what you're showing here, um, you would be very hesitant to try to use a tracking system that you weren't very familiar with. Yeah, one where you need to determine what the biases were and all from the live tracking data. Yeah, and so on um, on uh, some missions, um, this is an example where we start off in a geostationary transfer orbit. So, um, so this is an example where you might launch on a ride chair uh, with a geostationary transfer, and then go through a couple of phasing loops where you would have some more of these orbits. Yeah, and that gives you some additional time to figure out unknowns along the way. Um, although certain parts of the state may still be difficult to, uh, to observe, 
even in these phasing loops, if you have enough uncertainty um, in your system, it can be difficult to pull things out. So for example, if you have a number of ground stations that you're unfamiliar with, um, you know, even with phasing loops like this, it can be challenging to, to bring everything into spec where you want it to. Um, however, if you just have one or two things that are less known, and other system or other tracking stations, let's say that you're more familiar with, and um, you know you can rely on, then you can typically estimate the unknown guys given this kind of a configuration. And I think this is also um, the phasing loops and all. I think are also going to be more important with some of the low thrust systems. Right. Yeah. Because you're just not going to be able to do, you know, the entire orbit change all at once. The other thing um, about the phasing loops, and this is um, this is not the bearish heat trajectory, but it's philosophically similar, where we had some geostationary transfer size orbits, then we did maneuvers at perigee to raise apogee. Um, and as Lisa and Jim, you remember when we were working on Beresheet, we were managing the uncertainty because when we get to the moon, we have to perform really one of the biggest maneuvers of the entire mission is capturing here at the moon. And here we're trying to capture at approximately 100 kilometers off the moon. So I think you guys remember on Beresheet, while we're in the phasing loops, our whole goal here was getting our uncertainty down so we were within 100, you know, we could be within, you know, not, basically not hit the moon. We want to be 100 kilometers or greater above the moon. And mm -hmm. this phase of the orbit determination is a lot different than once you capture around the moon. It's almost like two different missions from an orbit determination point of view. Right, the yeah. Timeline, the timeline that you were just showing, John, was about a month from launch to lunar capture, right? That's right. Yeah, so that's that's how that's different. Instead of it taking, you know, five days on the direct transfer, you take about a month, perform multiple maneuvers, but in the meantime, you're you have time to test out, um, you know, or evaluate your engine. What's the performance we're getting um, out of the thrusters? What are the um, you know, tracking calibration activities you're doing between the transponder versus the ground stations, and you might have a little more time to look at all of that and have time to work out any kinks you may have on your, you know, your new spacecraft before you get to the moon. So you have that month-long time frame. It's not relaxing because you're still doing multiple burns and planning and yeah. uh, your next maneuver and reconstructing the previous maneuver all to get to the goal of capturing the moon. So it's not a relaxing one month, but it is, you do have more time to, from a spacecraft, from a system point of view, to work out any um, unknowns, or at least try to. <laughs> yeah, Lisa, I think that's probably one of the unsung heroes of orbit determination. You know, when people think of orbit determination, often they think, oh, well, where was the satellite? But really, an important part, like you said, is trip, you know, um, calibrating the tracking system. Because Jim, like you mentioned, a lot of times with these commercial companies, it's the first time they flew it. And then Lisa, you mentioned calibrating the engine. It's the first time. Sometimes it's the first time that engine's even been built. It's never been used before. And you have to do like a 600 meter per second or more maneuver to capture in at the, you know, at the moon, you can break it up into different ratios. It, the, the, the sum of them have to equal 800 meters per second. So you're getting ready to do this big engine and you've never fired it before. So if you go on this direct transfer, the first time you fire the engine, so if you go on the direct transfer and, the, and you're thrown on this trajectory, the, the first time, except for maybe a small couple meter per second trajectory correction maneuver, you would fire the engine is right here. And it's not calibrated at all. Whereas if we go on these uh, 
multi-phasing loop trajectories, you have many maneuvers where you can calibrate the engine. And I, I don't know, maybe, you know, from a, some people might not think of orbit determination as calibrating your hardware. That's what I was just gonna say or reiterate again is that, you know, yeah, traditionally we think of orbit determination as like an estimate of where we were, um, where the satellite was, and that's important for a lot of reasons, but really too, you're, you're taking your last, um, your last state from your last measurement and you're, um, you know, you can apply your uncertainty and propagate that forward to help plan your next events. Um, the other thing, the other thing is, you know, when we're doing orbit estimation where we were, you know, a lot of times that's important for once you're performing like a, a science mission, you know, so you've got your, um, you're already around the moon, you have your payloads that are performing or your instruments that are performing scientific measurements or scientific activities. And a lot of times the scientists want to know where were we around the moon when that, when those measurements or those, you know, collections took place so that they can do some correlation with their data. But um, so you know, that's really important too, is the like post-processing of all of the tracking data to deliver to the scientists so they know, oh, we were coming right around, you know, the lunar um, horizon or we were coming right around, you know, over these you know, specific um, areas of the moon that they were interested in collecting data on. Oh. And Lisa, yeah. you mentioned about, um, you know, calibrating the, the engines um, and uh, when you're performing these maneuvers in the phasing loops, um, you have to remember as well that it takes a little while to, uh, for the orbit determination process to hone in on how that maneuver performed. And John, if, uh, if I can yeah. share my screen, I can show you a little bit of, or an example of OD based on a configuration very similar to what you were just showing. Okay, so what, what this is, um, this is an uncertainty plot coming off of a filter that's operating on simulated data, but is operating on um, scenario very similar to what John was just showing, where you have multiple phasing loops on your way out to uh, the LOI at the moon. And these purple lines here uh, are representing where the maneuvers are uh, in this uh, scenario. And then the blue, red, and black lines are representing the trajectory uncertainty uh, in filtered estimates. So at each maneuver, what you see is that the uncertainty in the filtered estimate jumps up, and then it comes back down as we receive more tracking data after the maneuver. Um, and this is representative of the fact that maneuvers uh, have a lot more inherent uncertainty in the forces that they're applying to the spacecraft than the uh, forces from the natural environment. So we, when we take that into account, the uncertainty in the spacecraft position and velocity increases over a maneuver event. So um, what you can see though, is that it takes, you know, even after you start tracking on the other side of the maneuver, it can take a little bit of time uh, for that maneuver estimate or I'm sorry, for the trajectory estimate to get back down to kind of a nominal uh, level of uncertainty. And, you know, we're looking at, for example, on this maneuver, we're looking at a number of days, each one of these tick, mark, tick marks here is a day, you're looking at a number of days uh, before your complete uh, uncertainty gets back down to a nominal range. Now, these orbits themselves are on the order of a week or so. So it's still, you know, you're recovering accuracy and time to do your next maneuver, um, but it does take some amount of time uh, 
regain the accuracy. And this is also representative of the amount of time it would take to uh, figure out how the engines are performing. Mm -hmm. So as we move along here, the, at this end, we're on the smaller phasing loops. And then we, as we move to the right, we get on larger and larger phasing loops. And you can kind of see how the amount of time for accuracy recovery keeps stretching out. So it is related to the orbital period, how long it takes you to recover. And then if we look over here, um, this is actually a graph of the LOI maneuver. So we have LOI here uh, in the center-ish of the graph. And this is a much smaller time scale now. Um, we're showing only about a day and a half uh, total time on this graph. And you can see that the uncertainty, of course, jumps way up going across LOI. But now remember that after we've gone through LOI, now we're in orbit about the moon. So when we're in orbit about the moon, and in this case, we're going into uh, a lower orbit than what John was showing. This is going into a 400 kilometer circular orbit at the moon. But now our time scales are driven by the period of the lunar orbit. So, uh, so we're now not taking days or weeks to, to recover uh, to a nominal accuracy level. Now we're mostly recovered in a matter of, well, I would say six hours-ish here. So in that sense, you know, it's taking us a couple of revolutions around the moon to recover, um, but it's a much shorter time scale because of the fact that the orbital period is much shorter once we go through LOI. One of the things that this analysis is used for is to figure out how accurate it takes for you to recover from the first lunar orbit insertion, and then how many revs before you plan the second lunar orbit insertion. If, if your uncertainty is still too much, you won't even be able to plan it, let alone calibrate the engine. And that lunar orbit insertion one is where you on some spacecraft, you're losing like half the mass of your spacecraft in, in propellant. So um, I, you've probably heard me say this way too many times, but I, I always think that flight dynamics and orbit determination is like Rodney Dangerfield, that you, you get no respect. But um, a lot of times when uh, a mission planner just says, oh, well, you know, we're going to uh, be really, you know, sporting and we're going to capture and we're going to do three maneuvers and then we're going to go into orbit or land what you're what i think you're forgetting is well don't forget about orbit determination can you really track it can you calibrate your engine you know this is a brand new spacecraft and you're far away from earth so so i i think doing these analyses early in the mission planning really helps understand should you buy a better radio should you buy more time on the ground stations you know, what, you know, if, if you really have a timeline, does the orbit determination support that? Yeah, oftentimes um, when missions are proposed, the, these types of things John just mentioned aren't thought of yet. They're, you know, just building an initial mission concept and, you know, focusing on what the mission is going to do without necessarily paying a lot of attention to detail how you're going to get from here to there. And that's where orbit, determ orbit determination error analysis um, can be really helpful to, to have um, information for, um, about, sorry, to have information about the mission timeline. And you may end up, you know, having to, to get a whole different trajectory or design a whole different trajectory because you didn't consider all of these operational you know, timeline things that you have to figure out and you know an OD air analysis you know using the you know, simulated data just like Jim was describing can really provide a lot of insights into um, the whole mission design when you're deciding in the end which of these trajectories do we want to take and you know of a lot of times folks may say, oh, we just want to get to the moon. We want to get there fast. Um, we don't want to spend a lot of time in the radiation belt or, you know, it's a new spacecraft. We, you know, we want to get there fast and 
get there because the longer you're in orbit, the more things can go wrong. You know, so it's a I'm not trying to say people that think that way are wrong. It's just that's one way to think about it with that. But it's a it's a incomplete picture. Yeah. Um, and then when you do the OD simulations with a variety of tracking schedules um, with uncertainty in maneuver performance. And when you look at it all in a big picture, you have a well more informed mission um, design, you know, that you can say, okay, this is a flyable trajectory, even though we may not like it as much as our earlier design. Yep. Well, and the other thing is, is ground station av availability. Um, you know, if if you're used to flying geostationary satellites, then you can always see your satellite from your ground station. It's whenever you want to see it. You know, if you're flying in low Earth orbit, you don't have to worry about tracking. Whenever you can talk to a ground station, and they can be small dishes that you can talk with, you can telemeter the GPS data down. But here, you have to coordinate with ground stations, and if you're at the moon or on the way to the moon, you really can only track the satellite when you can see the moon. And so that's, you know, not even half the day. So um, I wanted to put a plug in for this movie, The Dish, <laughs> Sam Neill and Patrick Warburton. Everything you need to know about tracking lunar satellites is done in a very family friendly way in this movie. Um, I get very little. Uh, money for promoting this but so anyway definitely go and see the dish but but it, it really is i think that lisa you're right when people think about mission planning um, they think oh we have consumables we 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 can only spend five days to get there because we're going to boil off the propellant or like you said radiation those are all hardware decisions but so is your ground station and your transponder those are hardware decisions right and can you track it can you actually is your the engine that you're specifying is it accurate enough that you can do loose orbit determination or are you using something that is so brand new in your engine that you need to do tight orbit determination and more tracking so that you can calibrate and there's a huge trade-off that Lisa, i don't think we've seen very done very often in like the pre-phase a parts of the, the studies or the early studies yeah, a lot of times the missions that we've seen as, you know, reviewers or even participants and when we get brought in at some point after our mission is awarded, um, you know, when we look at the concept, quite often it's, it is like what you were saying, it, the concept is based on only a subset of the hardware decisions that have been made and not take into account like a full OD error analysis. And when I say a full OD error analysis, it's just like a feasibility, like something that's representative. You know, that's mm -hmm. really just just doing that sort of a once through when you're developing your early mission feasibility concepts and that kind of work, you know, just having that as a part of the design is it's more complete design. Yeah do all kinds of cases later on you know when, when you can look at all the different you know, yeah and we can just even describe i mean if a if there's some people watching this that haven't done or haven't heard of orbit determination error analysis it's kind of jim what you just did you come up with a candidate tracking hardware candidate ground station candidate tracking schedule you know we simulate the observations and then make pretend those are real observations we then do orbit determination and see can we calibrate that engine do we have enough tracking data or how many revs after the maneuver goes off before we're ready to plan the next maneuver it's 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 not some hard optimization thing it's just oh well right. what if i get one pass a day what if i get two passes a day what right. if i get a half hour pass what if i get a two hour pass so you can see some things like uh, at the loi here when like you guys were talking about the need to schedule the, the ground stations and all that kind of stuff and how important it is to have a ground station contact very shortly after the LOI. Um, I've zoomed out on the um, uh, LOI a little bit so that we can see the full growth of 
the uncertainty as the spacecraft goes through that maneuver. And this is only modeling a 1% uncertainty in the thrust and a 1% or I'm sorry, one degree uncertainty in the pointing direction of the maneuver. And yet you can still see how rapidly the uncertainty is growing because as John, you mentioned, this maneuver is big. This, uh, in my particular scenario, this was a little over 800 meters per second. Mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, just a 1% uncertainty in there. You know, and you're looking at eight meters per second of, you know, un uncertainty in that maneuver, and that grows very rapidly in terms of the orbital position error. So, you know, there is a need to get a contact very soon or as soon as possible after the LOI maneuver so that you can, uh, you know, keep this error growth bounded. And, and in fact, a lot of times this becomes a system engineering issue where the orbit determination somewhat innocently says, oh, well, if you have a 5% uncertainty on your maneuver, we need to do this. And then you can, from a system engineering point of view, you can either put a, a greater requirement on the propulsion system and say, well, you need to get the uncertainty down because we have this other mission goal, or we want to spend less money in the propulsion system, let it have a higher uncertainty because it's cheaper to buy tracking passes. So there's a whole system-wide optimization that I think, um, again, Rodney Dangerfield getting their respect. I think uh, a lot of times orbit determination is left out of that until the very last minute. And they say, oh, you know, and they assume that orbit determination is a, is a done thing, which for geostationary satellites and for LEOs, we've kind of been spoiled now um, because it's, it's almost a commodity capability where, going to the moon, you're very sensitive to, is your antenna even pointing in the right direction when you capture so you can get tracking data? If, you know, just putting an omnidirectional antenna on your spacecraft, um, like on the LADI mission, when we were doing a capture at a low inclination around the moon, actually retrogrades a very high inclination, during the maneuver, we were from the Earth, we were actually looking at the flames coming out of the satellite. So can you close the communications link during the maneuver enough to track? And if not, do you have to wait till the maneuver is done, reorient the spacecraft and start tracking right away? And some spacecraft are easier to reorient than others. And, and a lot of this is driven, and we ahead of time can model all this with the orbit determination software and see if it affects it. But you, you definitely want to bring orbit determination to the table early in the mission planning and concepts. It might even change your orbits. You know, Lisa, you said you're going to change your, your maneuver plan based yeah. on orbit determination. Yeah, and I think some of these other um, considerations are, what is your mission going to be doing? Are you just going, are you going, I should say just going to land. Are you going to land right. or are you going to be in orbit for a while and do science or other types of observation? So that also comes into play um, with you know, how, what, what OD error analysis you can do. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you know, if you're, orbit, if you're an orbiter, you may be only able to track certain amount of hours out of every day because the what John was talking about, the attitude, the you know, how the satellites orient it may have to be oriented in such a way that you can't do communications to Earth if the measurements from the payloads have to, you know, drive the attitude of the spacecraft. So we have to look at different trade-offs sometimes with the scientists to say, okay, how much data do you need to collect per day to meet your mission? And what does that mean for communications attitude? Can, can we not talk to the satellite from Earth during all of those times? And so you're, you may be really constrained or just actually sort of playing, um, trading off some things with the scientists early on to say, okay, well, 
in order for you to know where your satellite's going to be to plan your science, we have to have so much tracking data in order for you to do that successfully. So maybe you can back off on that a little bit. Do you really need 23 out of 24 hours a day of science data? Probably not. You want that, but you probably don't need right. it to complete your mission. So, you know, you're playing some games like John, you brought up like systems engineering, sort of like from a whole system. What, what do we want for tracking to be able to actually meet the science requirements? The science, uh, you know, when you're looking at a uncertainty in the orbit um, when they're doing their science work. Well, on Laddie, we had some uh, really um, tough to meet orbit prediction capabilities so they could point the science instrument. But I think we negotiated that we got, what, three to five orbits after every maneuver just for tracking so we could get back on, get back on track. Something like that. Yeah, there was definitely some negotiation um, with, and, and we did a bunch of trade-offs using simulated tracking data, like, you know, that ODTK let, let us do. Um, and they, you know, um, the other thing sometimes is uh, when we're looking at tracking measurement type, versus like the spacecraft capability, um, you know, traditional ranging or sequential ranging from the DSN, that takes up some of your, um, some of your link budget. So yep. your link margins are, you know, different whether you're doing Doppler or Doppler end ranging. And so we have to decide, okay, well maybe we can live with Doppler only because during these communications passes, um, mm -hmm. They're also going to be downlinking science data, or they're going to be, you know, doing other spacecraft activities, getting telemetry, uploading commands. So uh, maybe we can't get ranging during those passes when there's other heavy activities going on during those comms passes. So we can do things like um, do some trade studies with simulated data, saying, okay, Doppler only is fine. We only want some ranging once in a while, and you know, maybe it's at night when all the other Flight controllers are asleep or something, so they're not doing commanding and telemetry. Yeah. You can play those games too, but still there's a lot of trade-offs to talk about. Um, when some ground stations are now experimenting with the or doing the regenerative ranging, which uses less bandwidth, but it's not every ground station. Not every ground station, not every transponder has the yeah. capability of doing the uh, regenerative pseudo-noise ranging. Right. <laughs> Might have said that out of order, but yes. Um, yeah. but All those words. Being proposed on missions. And there's another aspect to this whole trading back and forth, right? That um, between science time and tracking time, and that has to do with the geometry of the tracking systems relative to the orbit about the moon. And if you don't have a, a really heavy tracking schedule, then the orbit accuracy that you can get from your orbit determination process it actually follows a cyclic pattern um, based on that, that geometry. So um, if you can see you this, want to share your screen? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This is showing uh, how the orbit uncertainty from the orbit determination system is varying. Um, over a month. And um, what you can see is that, the, well, the red here was representing in track uncertainty, and you can see how it has a cyclic pattern to it. And then the, um, the black is measuring cross track uncertainty, and you can see how it also has a uh, cyclic pattern. And um, what's going on here is the fact is that the geometry of the orbit relative to the ground stations changes throughout the month. So the orbit is basically staying fixed in inertial space um, as the moon goes around the earth. And so what you have is you have two times during the month when the ground stations are almost in the plane of the orbit, and then two times during the month when the ground stations are, are the line of sight from the ground stations is basically perpendicular to the orbit. And so that affects the type of orbit accuracy that you can get. Um, these um, low points in the um, in-track uncertainty correspond to when the ground station 
is inside basically the, the orbit plane um, because you're looking directly um, at the spacecraft either coming towards you or going away from you. Um, and that gives you really good uh, accuracy in the in-track direction, but at the same time. And that's, Jim, when using a Doppler measurement? This is range and Doppler. A range and so, Doppler. Yeah, because they're both line of sight measurements, right? They're both measuring just purely along the line between the spacecraft and the ground station. Um, because angle measurements at the lunar distance don't really help us much um, to give us, like in a, in a low Earth scenario, right? You have azimuth and elevation. It's a complementary to the range in Doppler in that they're providing measurement information in different directions. But those measurements become so weak at lunar distance that they don't really help. Um, and then when the um, spacecraft, or I'm sorry, when the ground station is in the in the orbit plane as well, the sensitivity to the cross track error becomes much less. And that's why you see the cross track errors go way up uh, during periods when uh, the in track error is low. Um, and, um, you have a corresponding thing going on when you're looking um, at the, um, the, the orbit plane from a perpendicular direction. Right? The cross track uh, uncertainty goes way down because now that's exactly what we're measuring, measuring directly in the cross track direction. But the in track uncertainty goes up because we're much less sensitive to the in track errors under that geometry. So when you're when you're trading back and forth between tracking time and science time and all, um, depending on wh what type of accuracy your science requires, um, you may need more tracking at certain times of the month uh, than other times of the month to meet the science requirements because of the geometry that is occurring between the ground stations and the moon. And, and just to say it, if you're not on a science mission and you're on a landing mission, you still care about predicted uncertainty because when you go to do your final maneuver to land, usually what you do is you take the uncertainty that's calculated by the orbit determination system and you use that as your initial starting point for the onboard guidance for the lander. So you're still managing uncertainty and managing that schedule and making sure that you do or don't have line of sight depending on what, what are the more important terms for the onboard guidance systems. Uh, you know, what does it need for its initialization? Now, how long, John, like on bear sheet, how long prior to the beginning of the final descent um, were we able to affect the orbit um, based on um, you know, ground-based orbit determination? What was the cutoff? What was the cutoff? I, I, forget, I forget what the cutoff was. Was it on the order of a day? It was, it was a significant period of time, I think. Yeah. For the last update. Yeah. I think we put that in our paper, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. What the cutoff yeah, well, that's an because that kind of goes into your discussion of like you need to use that orbit uncertainty from the OD system to kind of feed the landing process, but you're, you're not getting the benefit of tracking data right up to the point yeah, of the landing procedure. Yeah, let me see. Let me that. Just to go back to the graphs you were showing just now, mm -hmm. that was for a, a, uh, what I would call a polar lunar orbit. Right, right. And so like, for example, LRO is in an orbit like that, so something like right. that that you showed. Yeah, good point. Where, uh, you know, other missions that are just for equatorial orbiters be different patterns. True. True. But a lot of a lot of the you know uh, upcoming missions or proposed missions, you know, people are interested in doing polar. Um, they want to, you know observe the poles and look at the ice um land at the poles so a lot of the you know there's a lot of interest in getting into these polar orbits that you were just showing mm -hmm. 
you know, any mission that's going to want to have full ground coverage is probably going to be in at least a, a high inclination orbit, if not polar. So, um, so Jim, I, I uh, looked it up through the magic of video editing. <laughs> I looked up the timeline of maneuvers um, for the bear sheet mission, and it was pretty sporty. Um, we, we captured around the moon with a lunar orbit insertion one maneuver on April 4th. Then we did a maneuver on the 7th, the 8th, the 9th, and then the final maneuver. So we're kind of like in a circular orbit. We do a final maneuver to lower Paris lean to about 15 kilometers. That took place on the 10th. And then um, I think we did about 15 or 16 revs there. And then they started landing. So um, from the final, from the final maneuver to the um, initiation of the landing was, I think, only 15 or 16 orbits. So that's challenging to get the orbit determination, you know, and then the predict uh, to seat it on board. Yeah, well, that's that's especially um, scary thinking about that uh, parasoline altitude. What did you say that was? 16 kilometers? Yeah, it, 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 yeah, somewhere around 15 or 16 kilometers, if I remember right. Yeah. So that's another big difference between what you can do at the moon and what you can do at the earth, right? There's no way that you're going to be flying a satellite at 15 kilometers right. altitude around the earth. Well, on, you're not on, fly very long. <laughs> well, on, on Laddie, the scientists asked us to, in the extended mission, to go very low. So we actually brought terrain into satellite toolkit and we're plotting the OD uncertainty ellipsoid with respect to terrain. And wow. There were times when if we had got like a four sigma uncertainty, that was scraping the dirt on the moon. I, I'm sorry, we're supposed to use the word regolith, right? But <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty but, wild. And of course, that flying that low brings other types of requirements into the system, right? Like you're not we're used to being around the earth and flying with a, you know. 50 by 50 or 70 by 70 gravity field, and that's just not going to cut it for these kind of operations at the moon when, when you're down that low. Um, you know, you could be looking at 150 by 150, 200 by 200, or even, even larger gravity fields. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and now that GRAIL has the gravity models out there, the uncertainties on the gravity field have, have gotten, um, you know, a lot smaller. Right. Uh, when we, um, my first, uh, actually my first mission that was a lunar mission was Clementine. When we started that, I think we had a um, 16 by eight Bills and Ferrari gravity model or something, you know, huge uncertainties in the gravity. But so we designed the orbit to be really high mm -hmm. as a result. Um, um, yeah, totally, the, the Grail gra gravity models totally changed where the problems uh, in lunar prediction, or yeah, it, it went from being 100% in the gravity field to now uh, solar pressure can be your largest source of um, you know, dynamic model uncertainty. Yeah, well, one of the uh, one of the problems we had on the Clementine mission, um, the Deep Space Program Science Experiment, which was a NRL NASA mission when I was at NASA Goddard, was. Um, it was the first mission that Goddard had done around the moon in a long time, if ever. And so just configuring the software and, and we were using some uh, mainframe based orbit determination at the time. And there was a, an error there, but they had configured the software ahead of time to make sure that there was no atmospheric drag on at the moon. So they took all the input cards that had anything to do with atmospheric drag out. But if I remember right, the software is written such that if there are no input cards for atmospheric drag, then it threw Harris Priest around by default. So they're actually modeling atmospheric drag at the moon. And, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard this, but have you heard about the restaurant on the moon? No, I haven't. No, John, tell me about it. Believe it or not, there's a restaurant on the moon. It's got great food, but there's no atmosphere. <laughs> In any case, that is one thing that you think you don't have to worry about modeling around the moon, but make sure you don't model it around the moon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Turn it off. But um, 
So solar pressure, and then Jim, um, just thinking about it, when you fly over to subsolar point, um, you've got an albedo now. You know, from a thermal point of view, the thermal guys always say there's two moon, uh, two suns, you know, on either side, but I imagine if the gravity is well known now, I wonder if you can start to see some of that albedo reflection. Um, I would think so, especially at those low altitudes. Yeah. We only had a way to model it ahead of time to see mm. what the sensitivity to the different forces were. Hmm. You should think about that. that. <laughs> yeah. So, anything else about OD or on the moon other than it's exciting? Yeah, I think we've we've got everything that was on my list. Okay, well, I'd, I'd really like to thank uh, John and Lisa for joining me today to talk about Lunar OD. Uh, oddly enough, my, my boss says I have to go do real work now, so <laughs> I have to wrap up this discussion. But it's been a lot of fun talking with you guys. Um, for anybody watching the, uh, the video, uh, if you have questions, you can email them to info at agi.com. If there are questions for John and Lisa, we'll forward them along. Mm -hmm. the questions for me i'll do my best to answer them and uh and i guess that's about it so john lisa thank you so much for joining me today and well thank you that, that was yeah, all of your expertise thank you Jim. it was good having tea with you guys this morning yep. yeah exactly great i can go go hit up my pot of steeping earl gray now nice there you go <laughs> so that's all for today on Lunar OD. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. Okay, see ya.